This is the Patuxent River. It flows into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we're going to be going uh, just upriver of the Highway 4 bridge, and Highway 4 is actually the, uh, the very end of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, the same Pennsylvania Avenue that runs from D.C. and it ends right at the Patuxent River, a little location called Wayson's Corner. Uh, the uh, scorpion, or the wreck we believe to be the scorpion, is about one mile, two miles upriver from uh, that bridge. Uh, so we're about 30 minutes from Washington, D.C. We're about 20, 25 minutes from Annapolis, Maryland, and probably about uh, 40 minutes from Baltimore. Well, in, uh, in 1814, the river was, was deeper, uh, perhaps wider as well, too. There's been a lot of sedimentation from agricultural um, uh, runoff uh, since 1814. At this time, you know, during uh, the early 19th century and then in the 18th century, seagoing vessels were able to come fairly far upriver. Uh, sedimentation uh, stopped, you know, prevented that uh, very by, was preventing that by the late 18th century and 19th century. And then with 20th century, early 20th century uh, mechanized agriculture, there was a, a great influx of sediment into the river. During the War of 1812, the Chesapeake was uh, pretty much undefended. Uh, the British had free reign to come in, um, into, into the bay and uh, come ashore, uh, loot uh, plantations, villages, take what they wanted as well to, um, uh, you know, to also punish um, um, the American citizens. Um, Joshua Barney, who was a Revolutionary War, Naval War hero, uh, he proposed to build a uh, flying flotilla of uh, barges that uh, would be able to uh, defend the coast during the day, uh, intercept the British landing parties, and then at night um, uh, harry the, uh, the British fleet. And uh, he, he was given uh, permission and funds to do this. Uh, these were put under the Department of the Navy. Uh, since Joshua Barney was, had been retired and he was no longer in the seniority system within the Navy, he was made a Commodore. Uh, of this whole flotilla, and it was put on. It was kind of somewhat. It was part of the navy, but it was also separate from the uh, the navy. And on his first voyage out with his flotilla, uh, that he this was 15, 16, 17 ships. He ran into uh, superior British ships who chased him up the Patuxent River. He fought some retreating battles. At one point, he was uh, bottled up in uh, St. Leonard's Creek, and then was uh, was able to fight his way out. But he couldn't fight his way into the bay. He was forced to come further and further up river, retreating. The British following him, their forces uh, building, until the point that he got so far up river he could not get any further up river, and it was apparent that uh, that the British could capture his ships. So he was ordered by uh, the Secretary of the Navy uh, to abandon his uh, ships, and uh, when the British, you know, tried to take them to uh, set them uh, on fire to explode them with uh, gunpowder. Uh, which he did, effectively, and it was at this point where we are now when the, uh, the British guy came up river that uh, they, they could see the mast of Barney's flotilla, and, uh, but very soon afterwards they saw that the, uh, the ships were on fire and heard the explosions from the uh, powder kegs uh, that were set. Uh, they uh, went further on up river and found uh, the fleet entirely scuttled except for one vessel that the, um, uh, the fuse went out on and they were able to capture this vessel and bring it uh, down river with them. That buoy we see up there marks the wreck. Okay. Well, we're over the site of uh, the shipwreck. We think it could be the uh, USS Scorpion, the flagship of uh, uh, the Barney Flotilla. And um, it's, the bow is towards the bank, just, uh, just beyond this, the, the tree that's been sawed off, sawn off or cut off, and then the stern comes out into the channel a little more towards the red buoy that you see over here. We are involved in the commemoration of the War of 1812, and uh, we propose to uh, relocate and excavate this shipwreck site because it was uh, probably one of the, the best known and best preserved of uh, the Navy's War of 1812 vessels. So you dive in the water here yourself. What's it like diving in this water that, that looks pretty hard to see through? It's kind of like diving in pea soup. It's, uh, the visibility is uh, not very good at all. The best it ever gets is a foot or two. Um, it's, you know, so it's, it, and it's hard to, uh, it, it is hard to, to measure and read tapes and to work and you almost have to work by braille, by feel and by touch. Uh, but you can get used to it. As a, if you're an underwater archaeologist and you've worked in uh, black water, then you do get used to, um, you know, maneuvering around when you have very limited visibility uh, and also you can you know determine what you're working on and what you're feeling by, by touch so your other senses kind of improve with time when you have low visibility however you know the visibility here even though it's it looks pretty bad 
that we have had at times, you know, up to a foot or two, and so we have been able to take some video of the wreck site and uh, uh, as well. So and, and and to see a little bit of what what we're doing at times. Um, anyway, this is what we propose to do in uh, 2013 in commemoration of the War of 1812 is to look at this uh, this shipwreck. And uh, which is really a time capsule from uh, this time period in 1814. Uh, we know that we found some surgeons' uh, equipment, medical supplies, uh, surgical scalpels, scissors, and such. Uh, we expect there to be the personal effects of the crew, which will help tell something about uh, ethnicity, about who they were, what uh, what their economic status was. Uh, one one such artifact is. Uh, it's a grog cup uh, from, uh, with the initial CW on it, uh, believed to be belong to an African-American sailor named Caesar Wentworth. There were a number of African-American sailors serving in the flotilla. 